Welcome everyone to the Door Coach uh, Show. <laughs> Actually, the AM 1150 Garden Show. And Ken Salville here today. Don Burnett is away, and uh, we're going to be talking about gardening. And holy smokes, is it ever smoky out there? Uh, I can only see, looking out the window, about a block. That's about it. Not very far. And so uh, I can't. There's no way I can see the lake from here. And I'm only like, like I say, a block, block and a half away from the lake. So there you go. It is smoky out there, so it's a good day to listen to the garden show and uh, make some, you know, write down some questions. If you have some questions about the garden, anything to do with fertilizing or pruning or trimming or watering or any of that thing, if any any of the plants at all that are showing signs or symptoms, you know, uh, ask the question today. It really helps everybody learn about gardening. So all the listeners who are tuning in uh, really appreciate it when people do call in with questions. So. Please do so. And on that note, we're going to start the show with the tips and plants of the week. All righty, now my tip of the week this week is that it's time to plant onions. And it sounds pretty strange because here we are at the beginning of August, or right at the end of uh, July, beginning of August. And this is actually a time when we do plant onions in the garden. And we plant them by seed, and we water them and take care of them and get them up and growing. And we actually plan on leaving them in right through the winter. And uh, this is how we get maximum size onions for the future. And uh, you have to check on your varieties and how they grow and and if those are varieties that it's recommended uh, to grow that way. Any plants that you buy as a set or any where you buy the little young onions, those would be ones you could do right now. So kind of a fun thing to try and... uh, should really improve the size of the onions for next year. So give it a try. Time to plant onions. All right, now my plant of the week is the hydrangea Annabelle. And that whole group of Annabelle hydrangeas, they are just one of the most beautiful plants. And they're the white uh, pom-pom type uh, hydrangeas that you see around town. They grow in the full sun. They grow in part shade. They grow in almost any conditions. And pretty tough plant. Zone 3, so they survive the cold and uh, pretty easy to deal with. You can cut them down if you need to to uh, encourage them to shoot up and rejuvenate each year. But uh, really nice plant, one of my favorites. And uh, now there's a lot of new varieties that are available. Some are even more compact and are a little bit, let's say, more well-behaved. So try the Hydrangea Annabelle and, uh, yeah, enjoy them. They're in full bloom right now. All righty, that's my tips and plants for this week. Remember to check growercoach.com. All righty, so thinking of growercoach.com, uh, we are, in, it's on my mind, you can tell, like off the top of the show, I was talking about it right away. And uh, we're in the process of developing our new uh, website. Uh, we have our existing website that we've had for a few years, and we've been trying to sort of clunk it together bit by bit. And it's 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 a good website. We really uh, enjoy it, and there's lots to read and and our blogs and newsletters and things, which, uh, you know, because we've been under construction now for at least a couple of months, that, um, that uh, you know, we haven't really been able to keep up with, with everything that we would normally like to keep up with. But now summer's here. We're, our goal is to get by the end of August to have a new website set up and uh, ready to access. So on the new website will be a series of seminars available that are on demand. So all you have to do is you can go in, you can pick your category, whether it's vegetable gardening or landscaping or landscape maintenance or or fruit tree growing, whatever the topic is, and you can click on that, and then they'll give you a list of different uh, classes that you can join. And all you do is click on the class. Uh, Some of them have a fee, some of them are free, and you just click on them and you can watch the videos at your leisure and enjoy uh, learning about those topics. So it's kind of a fun thing. And uh, we've been working on this for, geez, I think since at least 2012. So coming up on 10 years. And of course, you know, the priority is to keep the wheels rolling on the KHS landscape design. (laughs) Uh, business and and installation we uh you know we it's always the big number one focus but uh, in the background always trying to develop uh the the website and and so with the grower coach website we have our grower coach um 
uh, YouTube channel, which is becoming more and more popular. And, and we really do appreciate it when people do go to our, our channel and watch the videos. Uh, same kind of concept there. It's all about education and teaching people about plants. And we have quite a wide selection of different topics there to learn about. Um, but yeah, there are videos that will run anywhere from two to three minutes, anywhere up to an hour. And uh, you're even able to sometimes uh, listen to some of these uh, garden shows uh, via that. Um, just a couple of them we have there online available. And yeah, so check that out. And uh, remember that when you watch our videos, you really help us build the channel. It's what we're trying to do is is to build up the uh, the hours of, of watching, so the actual watch time, so that we can actually start to monetize it and start to get paid by YouTube. It's really what the ultimate goal is. So we really, really appreciate it whenever people do click on it, watch, enjoy the videos, watch them right to the end, click the like button and don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell for the notification bell so that uh, every time we send out new videos, which is around two or three a week, sometimes only one a week, but we are pretty steady on the uh, the development of videos. And so check it out. Um, I think we have uh, quite a few hundred there available for your viewing pleasure. All right, so that's enough about that topic. But uh, hey... Even though it's smoky out, you know, we're still gardening and plants are still needing our attention. Um, you know, I think today the forecast is it's going to be pretty much smoky right through the day and right into the evening today. Uh, but uh, tomorrow morning we get a little bit of a break. So hopefully the wind's going to come through and it's going to shift a little bit. They're predicting a little bit of rain. You know, I, I think if it's, uh, if it's over 700 drops, I think, you know, uh, I think we'll be happy with that, but it'd be nice if it was an actual downpour where we actually got some moisture. So uh, you never know. You never know. You never know what we're going to get. So we have to keep our fingers crossed. Let's get some moisture out there and help to back off the wildfire wildfire situation a little bit. And uh, yeah, it's just a, it's, it's a really a, a horrible thing out there for a lot of people. And uh Right now, like on a day like this where we're socked in with smoke, you almost have to stay indoors. But, you know, our indoor plants need help too. We need to be paying attention to those plants. And uh, that's what I'm saying is on a day like today, I know it is a long weekend, so people are out and about. But if you're not and you're you're hunkering down here and staying inside, staying out of the smoke, well, maybe we should just do a little check on the plants. Um, I wrote an article uh, about a year or so ago about about the you know new cell phones and how great they are at scheduling things and reminding you of things. And one of the, th- the topics that I talked about in that article was how we can use that your cell phone to set uh, um, actual uh, reoccurring events like watering your house plants. <laughs> Put a reminder in your phone that pops up about whether it's twice a week or so, is usually you want to check your plants very closely indoors about twice a week. In the summertime, when it's much warmer and, uh, you know, the evaporation rate is so much higher, that those plants may need more attention. They might need that almost daily or at least every second day when it's hotter. So let's just all be aware of that, that, that we need to pay a little bit extra attention to those plants. And if you want to make a note, if you are a house plant lover and you have a, a bunch of plants, or even if the plants are outside right now, you know you're going to bring them in. Before you bring them in in the fall, which is typically around mid-September, that's sort of a typical time we aim for, uh, we want to make sure those plants are well leached. And so what leaching is, is all the year long when we're watering, watering, watering the plant, and, and especially during the winter, we're not watering as much. But what's happening is the plant will use all the water up that's that you're putting into the pot, but they tend to not use all the minerals up that you put into the pot. So those minerals tend to stay behind, and they, they call them salts. And those minerals, they build up and build up and build up in your soils, and you'll often see a little bit of a white crust on the surface, and th- that can be actually like a salty uh, product forming on the top can't always say what it is but we know it's classified in the category of salts now if we're not (laughs) removing those salts by dissolving them uh, at least once a year and sometimes twice a year is what's recommended for all your house plants then those plants are going to start to get stressed out and they start to show all kinds of bad symptoms like crispiness on the edge of the leaf 
and uh, and uh, they can really struggle quite a bit. So, you know, what we do is a friendly thing. When we have small potted plants, we could just take them over to the sink and give them a really good soaking, and the water comes out the bottom of the holes, goes down the drain, give it a really good moist, moistening, and then let it sit and drain for a bit, and then even do it, wait 15, 20 minutes, come back, do it again one last time, and that would be classified as a leaching. So that would wash all those excessive salts and minerals down the drain. But when it comes to bigger plants, the bigger plants are a bit of a hassle. And so this is why I say it's sometimes better to just, uh, you know, get the family together, grab those big old plants, get them outside in a nice shady spot. Remember, don't put them out in the sun because they will fry if they go in the sun. Get them around the shady side of the house and uh, keep them in a protected spot. And then give them that watering with the hose where you fill the pot right up. And just make sure you have holes in the bottom of the pot. It has to drain out the bottom. But you fill it up and let it drain and fill it up and let it drain and fill it up and let it drain. And you just keep up with that process that process over and over again, uh, sometimes uh, even you know over a couple hours. Because as you're moistening it, the salts slowly dissolve into the water and then you wash them away and they dissolve a bit more and then you wash them away. And then you're refreshing the soil and you let it drain out completely after uh, a period of time of leaching and then you're ready to return it to the house. And again, zip it right back into the house, right back into its same spot with a tray under it, of course, so that any of the water that's remaining from the leaching will, will trickle out. Uh, but this process is so critical for plants that are in pots, especially, you know, in, if you live in an area where your water tends to have a lot of minerals in it, which is a lot of places where that is the truth. And uh, also, uh, you know, fertilizers that we're adding. Sometimes the plants are not using up all those fertilizers and they tend to build up. So again, those are all classified as salts and roots are, are requiring that the inside of the root is very salty and the outside of the root is not salty so that it can suck water in because water will always migrate to areas of high salt concentration. So if we have higher salts in your soils than you have in your roots, you've got a problem. You've got almost like reverse osmosis. You've got all this salt sucking the water out of your root system. And then that leads to issues with your plant. So leaching twice a year. Just do it and enjoy it. <laughs> the plants certainly do. And you know, as the water trickles through those roots or through the soil and comes out the bottom, it's like a vacuum it creates and it sucks fresh air in behind it. So it really rejuvenates the soil itself. So it's a real good tip. Something I think we, well, like I say, you pretty much need to do that twice a year. So I'm mentioning it now. So write it down, put it in your calendar on your phone, put it in for twice a year. But always when you can get them out, especially the big plants have to go out when the temperatures are reasonable. They don't want to go outside if the temperatures are below about 10 degrees Celsius. So, so you have to watch that and be aware of that. All right, so uh, <laughs> that's it for the int introductory part of the show. Uh, we're going to take a short break here, and uh, we do invite your calls, 862-2525. That's 250-862-2525 to get through to us today. Uh, give us a call. We'll answer your gardening questions, and we'll be back right after these messages with more AM 1153. Alrighty, we are back with you on this uh, smoky Saturday morning, and uh, we do welcome your your phone calls. Please give us a call, 250-862-2525 to get through to us today. And uh, yeah, we're talking about gardening as we do on The Garden Show. And uh, we actually have a few of our, uh, a few people have sent in questions. Uh, again, you can send your questions in on the email uh, right now to Ken at growercoach.com. And uh, that is uh, one way you can get your questions in. So anyway, I'm just going to read a few of these. Sometimes they're just short and sweet. But uh, Mary asks, uh, what is a good fast-growing tree? And that is a good question. Uh, when you have trees, uh, the basic rule of thumb is, is if you have a small tree, they tend to grow slower. If you have a medium-sized tree, they tend to grow, oh, medium, 
<laughs> and if uh, if you have a large tree, they'll often grow quite fast. So that sometimes is a good rule. So uh, one of the things you can think about when it comes to uh, to picking a tree is number one is the silhouette of the tree. So what the shape of the tree. So you know if you need a lot of shade, you might want a very broad shaped tree. But if you have a narrow space and you don't have much room, you might need to grow a columnar tree or something that grows tall and narrow. And so when you're selecting that tree. You have to think a little bit about it, but number one is what is the silhouette? What shape do you want that tree to be? And then once you've decided on the silhouette, then you can go to which trees are available with that shape in mind. And so in the case of a large tree, uh, there are several really good big growing trees, uh, but again, depends on your climate, where you're living and that sort of thing. And, and uh you know the you know obviously some of the maples are fairly large like a silver maple is a very big large fast growing tree and but it can be a it can be quite massive actually so you have to be prepared for those big trees you need big areas you know london plane tree is another big tree that grows quite large uh platanus acerfolia is a big big tree and so you know each of those trees has their pros and cons um uh, i would always say that uh ultimately the less pest problems the better but don't always consider things like aphids or leaf rollers as a pest because they get on almost every tree and they, they're just a temporary thing they last for a few weeks at certain times of the year and then uh, other beneficial insects will come in and eat them all including little birds and things so i don't really uh, worry too much about that type of pest you may see the um, webworm caterpillar out on some of the trees uh, they'll sometimes get into maples and uh, they can cause a little bit of an issue um, we're seeing that now. But again, when you do see those tent caterpillars or webworms in the trees, uh, you don't really cut the branches off the trees. You just sort of, if you if you could, it's, it's quite harmless. And if you're not too, uh, you know, afraid of gory things, but you can just reach in. If you can reach it, you can reach in and just pull all the webbing off the branch. And, you know, some of the leaves come off too, but you pull all the webbing off and it'll be full of all those little caterpillars. And you can do the caterpillar stomp and uh, you're done. And that's the quickest, easiest thing to do because the tree can regrow leaves. There's no point in cutting the whole branch off just because it's got a few caterpillars on it. So um, good to be aware of that sort of thing. Webworms are a problem on maples, but on the London plane tree, which is the other large tree we're talking about, uh, they really don't get those uh, problems very often. They don't have too many pests. You know, they have a, a, a sort of a seed pod thing that some people are a little bit allergic to. But other than that, they're certainly a good, strong tree and uh, pretty tough. So uh, to answer your question, uh, Mary, that is is the probably the two big trees that just come to mind that are uh, very easy to grow and relatively uh, fast growing. So the silver maple and the London plane tree. All right, now uh, we've got uh, Bill asking a question. Uh, how long should I water my lawn? And uh, <laughs> that's pretty short and sweet. Um, and it's a very excellent question. It doesn't matter what your irrigation system is. How long do you water your lawn? Well, the answer is about a half an inch. There you go. So that is the, the, the question of the day. So how long does it take to get a half an inch of water? Well, you have to tell, uh, you have to figure that out. You have to figure it out. So you have to either take cake pans or some little, uh, cat food cans or dog cans, and you can place them out over the lawn in about say 10 feet apart. And then just let your system run overnight and see what happens. And let's see how much water shows up in those cans. In a perfect world, those cans would all fill up with exactly the same amount of water. That would mean you have this beautiful, even irrigation system. It's evenly precipitating, what they call an even precipitation rate. It's evenly applying water over the whole surface, because no matter where your cans are, they all have the same amount of water in it. That would be ideal. Now, the... Uh, the amount of water is the next factor. So let's say you've got your zone set at a certain number of zones, and then you go out there and you see, well, there's only like an eighth of an inch of water in these cans, and I'm supposed to apply a half an inch in, in, in a watering. Well, then, you know, you go back and you know you have to 
potentially if you had a quarter of an inch of water in the can, you'd have to double your, your run time and that would, the duration would increase and that would add the little bit extra water into that watering. And so the more water you add, the deeper you usually water. Uh, so on the other hand, if you have cans at a rate full in the morning when you get up, you know you're way over watering. So then you start cutting it back by half right away, trying to get down to that half inch level. And so that's also a factor that is really important. So you don't want to be just wasting water. It doesn't help uh, sometimes to just be drowning everything. Remember that grass is a prairie plant. You know, it lives on the prairies. It just grows out there and it's happy as can be and you know sometimes it rains and sometimes it doesn't and it's still fine we're kind of training our grass to live with water consistently all the time and so you know i think we should always be training our grass to live without water sometimes and you know plants now we know it's proven that they have a memory so you know if you go through a period where you always let your grass just dry out between each watering it will remember that it's going to be a drought and it won't it won't freak out <laughs> it won't have a it won't freak out if there's no water there one day so just uh, sort of be aware of that that you know grass is a prairie plant it should be allowed to dry out dry out between waterings but to answer that question it is uh, the time is half an inch. (laughs) So you have to tell me, nobody really knows from one system to the other how much water your system's producing over a given area. So that's the answer to that one. It's a a good question, actually. So then uh, we have uh, another uh, question there. Um, This is an anonymous question, but it says, um, what is a good uh, organic fertilizer to use for my vegetable patch? And, you know, for veggies, one of my favorites, I have two that I like to use. Um, One is the kelp fertilizer. So this is like it often comes either as a liquid or even a granular sometimes. But the kelp is is one of these really great products that can be used that will uh, really, really uh, boost the garden and really get things growing. It's super, super uh, healthy for the plants and they really love it. So that's a good one. And you know, another one that I use is the alfalfa pellets. And you can buy pelletized alfalfa um, at uh, the feed stores and that sort of thing. And what I do with that is I tend to uh, dig it in underneath uh, into the soil before I plant. And then those alfalfa pellets, because they're green, they're like a green manure, they start to release into into the soil and they develop quite a bit of nitrogen and other nutrients. And they really, really, uh, really, really uh, feed those plants. I have just fabulous success with that each year. Now, I do a bit of what's called the no-dig method, which is I don't really turn the soil much. So every year I fill my beds up, and every year they kind of sink by about four or five inches every year because it's all organic matter and compost. So what I do in the springtime is I apply that a nice even amount of the alfalfa pallets on the surface of the ground, and then I put about four to five, even six inches of compost over top of that. And then I plant the garden, and watch out. It just <laughs> it grows like crazy. So pretty fun, fun to be, uh, be able to garden and have a spot to grow some plants and to experiment a little bit. So, all right, uh, we're going to take another short break here. Again, we do invite your calls. We do have our special guest uh, calling in uh, again this week. Dan Bruce will be on the line uh, talking about something very interesting. So uh, hang on and uh, don't forget to call in, but listen in for for Dan's uh, chat here this morning. And we'll be back right after these messages with more AM 1150 Garage. Alrighty, we are back, and uh, it is a smoky day out there, but luckily we have Dan Bruce on the line this morning. Good morning, Dan. How are you? I'm not too bad, Ken, um, but um, I'm not an antidote for smoke. That's one thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, how are you doing? Are you handling the smoke okay? Um, <clears throat> yes. Um, I'm surviving so far. Um, it hasn't really caused any problems other than it's really depressing you can't see anything yeah exactly Uh, how do do birds do through this process i guess they have no choice they just have to Um, suffer through like we do yep same thing wow um 
Well, there you go, eh? Anyway. Yeah, so um, you've got a topic today to chat about. Well, <clears throat> one thing that happens around Christmas time is that um, you get to um, crack open and eat Brazil nuts. Ooh, yes. Mm. And um, it's kind of interesting because the Brazil nut, that would be Bertholletia excelsa, Ooh. is a very large tree native to the Amazon basin. Mm-hmm. And it is not, strictly speaking, cultivated. Oh. So all the Brazil nuts that you um, see or are available are picked up off the forest floor, mostly by um, Aboriginal peoples living in that area. And um, Hmm. they're brought to a central location, and um, they're sold. Hmm. But the Brazil nut is, as I said, a very large tree. Um, The nuts themselves are encased in a very, very hard shell, Hmm. which um, falls to the ground when it's ripe and shatters. The um, nuts go flying all over the place. Hmm. So picking them up is a time-consuming wow. thing, one by one. Sounds like you need to wear a hard hat in that business. Um, yes, but the trees are so tall, you've got quite a bit of notice that one's coming down because you hear it coming <laughs> <laughs> through the branches. Oh, my God. So uh, what kind of diameter would... Like, what are we talking about, like a baseball size or... Oh, no, bigger? something more like a football. Oh, my God. Um, anyway, the, um, um, that's the Brazil nut. And then another thing that is familiar to us, um, in the stores is the cashew. Mm. And that is also a native of South America, a bit further south than the Amazon basin itself, Mm -hmm. more open grassland. Right. Um, a lot of these trivia question things ask you um, what plant has its seeds on the outside of the fruit, and the standard answer that they give you, the only one they, the only one they offer you is the strawberry. But in fact, the cashew is just as relevant there. <laughs> it's a very strange-looking fruit, isn't it? The um, yeah, it looks like a sort of a soft, squishy pear. It can be orange, reddish, or yellow. And underneath it is the nut. Hmm. And does the nut have a shell on it? Yes, it does. It's not a hard shell like a hazelnut. It's more like a, a thick, leathery shell, oh. which contains a very nasty, corrosive um, fluid. Mm. Don't get that in your mouth. Oh. Um, so getting the nut out of the shell is quite a proposition, hmm. which may account for the expense of cashews. Mm-hmm. And and what was it? Did you not tell me one day that uh, that the fruit is good to eat? Yes, um, it's kind of sweet, sour. Hmm. Um, you can make a refreshing sort of fruit drink out of it. You can also, um, for those who have been to Belize, know that you can make wine out of it. Mm. Um, Belizean cashew wine, well, let's say the the quality varies from place to place. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Uh, And leave it at that. Uh, (laughs) But the the thing about um, these two trees is that... um, for millennia, the uh, native peoples have consumed these things, and when I say they're not exactly cultivated, there, there's a different sort of agriculture going on, or it was going on down there. Mm-hmm. There's increasing evidence that the lower Amazon uh, supported a huge population. Um, the first 
Spanish explorers through there reported hundreds of thousands of people. Mm. Um, some anthropologists have denied this and said, no, that couldn't be. Um, but as I said, there's increasing evidence that that is, in fact, what what was going on. Mm. Um, there's a concept that the Amazon rainforest is, is a pristine, untouched um, but that would appear not to be so because the native peoples have in fact been, if you like, selectively logging it, mm. uh, not from the point of view of timber, but they've been removing um, one by one here and there, here and there, one by one, removing trees that do not produce anything that they could use. Ah, interesting. And leaving the trees that did produce what was useful. Right, that makes so sense. So you've got what what you might call incipient agriculture going on here, hmm. but on a, a fairly massive scale. I mean, the, the plants themselves are full-size trees. <laughs> yeah, unbelievable. Is, is and then... In and amongst and around this whole thing, there were openings where um, corn, that is maize and cassava, were cultivated. So in fact, you have a situation where um, a, a large population can be supported by this type of agriculture. Mm -hmm. Um, so you need open land for that. Yes, but um, it doesn't have to be like a bald prairie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Trees can stand, you know, around in it, and these crops can be grown with great success, particularly along the riverbanks. Mm hmm so, like, just to back on the these two nut trees, um, is there seasonality to their system? Like, being in, in a tropical or subtropical area, is there actually, like, a season when they come ripe, or do they just constantly um, drop year-round, or do they produce year-round? Well, there there is seasonality, but it's not quite so pronounced as it is, you know, this far north. Mm -hmm. um, the seasonality is hidden um, from our view, by the the whole grocery trade, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, because um, if you want a, a Brazil nut right now, they are available, but nobody will bring them in because it's not that season, right? Um, so that's what kind of creates a seasonality mm -hmm. that may in fact not really exist but down in that environment the people who live there have gathered over the centuries enormous knowledge of what is out there and what's usable and what isn't um, there are clearly hundreds of species of plants that contain all sorts of um, substances that um, could be developed mm -hmm. in a medical context. Mm -hmm. um, and research is going on, but um, so is massive destruction. So, yeah, um, it's not it's, not looking good right now. <laughs> it's a question. Of, you know what? What do you? Where do you put your value? Mm -hmm. um, not all of these substances are necessarily um, beneficial. I mean, there is something down there. It's a small tree called Ryania. Mm -hmm. And um, if you gather the, the leaves and the twigs and the bark and the wood and burn it, if you so much as inhale the smoke that smoke is toxic it it will it will it will be fatal wow 
So when you're burning so, when you're burning your rainforest, you have to be careful what you're burning. Well, if the whole forest is going up, then I mean that's yeah, that's just totally fatal anyway. Yes. But um, you don't want to have a campfire made of Ryania wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> How would you know unless you were a botanist? Well, or one of the the local people who have grown up with that. Yeah, they would say, don't burn that. <laughs> um, Interesting. Well, that's pretty fascinating, Dan. That is, that's pretty cool stuff. And so with the Brazil nuts now, uh, they're, they're not all just grown. Now they're grown in different parts of the world, right? They're not just all from the South America now? No, I think they're all from their traditional normal territory. Oh, okay. Um, I'm not sure about this, but I have been told that some entrepreneurs tried to um, farm plant commercially, uh, farm the Brazil nut in Florida. And mm. apparently they had good success with germination and tree growth, and the trees produce flowers at the right time and everything was looking good, but they didn't produce a single nut. Yeah. Because... The pollinating insects did not live in Florida. <laughs> Funny how that is. Um, now I'd have to check on the the, the details of that story, but um, it, it could very well be that that's what happened. Wow. Well, then things we got to wrap it up. So thank you so much for your topics today. It's always uh, interesting. The 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 the, the just uh, things you don't think about every day that we well, are, seem quite common. We, um, we mentioned cassava as one of the um, crops grown uh, in the Amazon basin. Mm -hmm. So maybe next week we'll um, have a more detailed look at that mm -hmm. and um, uh, yeah. see where that leads us. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds great, Dan. Well, thanks very much for phoning in today. It's been a, a really cool topic, and we'll talk to you again next week. We will. All right. Thanks, Dan. Take care. Okay. Yep. Bye now. Bye for now. All right. There you go, Dan Bruce, and uh, another amazing topic. Very cool. All right. So we're going to take a short break, and uh, when we come back, we'll come back with more gardening information after these messages with more AM 1150 Garden Show. Alrighty, welcome back, everyone. Um, hang in there with the smoke out there. <laughs> but uh, we have a uh, caller who's called in and asked the question. Um, you know, if I if I could just talk a little bit about moving plants during this hot weather, and particularly perennial plants. So perennials, uh, perennial plants are plants that come back year after year, but they tend to be herbaceous. So they're often called herbaceous perennials. They die to the ground in the wintertime. So anytime that plant is dying down or is dormant, that plant is quite easy to relocate and move because it, it's not relying on, on water or anything to keep the tops alive. It's just like a root mass and it's dormant. So often in the fall or the spring are the easiest times to move some of these plants. Uh, but at this time of year, you can still do it, and, and they move relatively easily, I'm, I'm going to say, but it's just up to you to, to be on it with the hand watering. And so what I would do is if I had a plant, I would just uh, I would look at its condition right now. So is it dry or is it moist? Um, if it's, if it's uh, dry, I might want to just give it a really good soaking to make sure that the, the plant itself is, is nice and moist and the roots are moist and it's starting to take up some of that water so that it sort of becomes hydrated. And then once it's well hydrated, say maybe the next day or so, during cool temperatures, which are usually best late in the evening at this time of year, uh, you can actually uh, dig that plant up and move it into its new location, plant it in, and again, give it a really good soaking right away. Plant it at about the exact same depth it was prior, so you're not changing anything from its depth of planting. And if you always add a little bit of compost around it on the surface, that helps to hold the moisture in and just keep the roots a little bit protected. Uh, but then again, good soaking of water, 
And let's say at this point, <laughs> it's 930 in the evening, but you did it and you, you really want those plants to survive. So now we're going into a cool period for about 10 hours or so. So we go into this period where it's not the blazing hot sun, which is great. Now this gives the plant just a few hours, even though it takes about three weeks for the roots to actually start to grow again. You've really gone through the worst of this whole thing during periods when the temperatures are cool. So that plant comes through usually unscathed. It'll actually come out, and then the next day when it gets hot in the afternoon, the thing might try to wilt again a little bit, but you can just spray the whole plant with water and give it a good soaking at the root. And the key with transplanting in the heat or even planting anything is that you have to water it once a day, and and it's usually best right in the middle. Usually what I do is I water them first thing in the morning so that they go into the day with moisture, but in the late afternoon, sometimes you have to give them a little mist of water just to soak the plant a bit, give it a little bit of humidity, and that helps it survive until the temperatures cool off in the evening. So, you know, again, very highly valued plants, I would do that. I would give it a shot in the morning uh, before the heat comes on, and then I'd give it a shot sort of in the late afternoon when it's starting to really heat up and just to humidify the plant and give it a break. And then do that for about maybe about a week and the plant should be fine. It should be starting to establish again. And then you can just go back to regular waterings or every second day or every third day even. So depending on the plant, if a perennial plant is very uh, drought tolerant species, then it will, uh, it will survive. It'll just keep on going. It's, sometimes they don't even blink when you move them. But if a plant is sort of delicate and it doesn't like being moved, it's kind of a cool, moist type of plant, um, then, you know, sometimes you get a little more suffering going on. So that misting effect, like just giving the plant a quick spray of water, releases the stress off of it. So you want to do that uh, maybe maybe several times uh, throughout the day just to keep it alive. If it's looking rough, (laughs) and sometimes you know when it's looking rough, poor plant just collapses. All right, uh, we're going to go to the phone lines, and it and, uh, looks like we have Eric on the line. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, Ken. Good morning. I, uh, I got a question about a dogwood that I bought off Maria at Bylands a mm-hmm. couple years ago now. Yep. Um, when I first bought it, it was, of course, blooming. I planted it in the spring. Yep. Good soil, good hole. Everything was great. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next year, you know, came up uh, and blossomed beautifully. Mm-hmm. Last year... I went out and uh, I was gone for a while, so it got a little bit dry. When I got back, I was gone for about a month, mm. and it got a little dry. Um, the leaves were a little crispy, but it was still green and 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 fine, and, mm-hmm. and shed its leaves as normal. But this year it came up; uh, it leafed out beautiful. The leaves looked great, good, um, but no blossoms. Yep. So uh, how that works is that those buds, those flower buds, are formed right about at this time of year, right around the beginning of August. And so uh, in order for the growth phase of that plant to be just in the right spot to form those flower buds, it has to be just kind of cruising along like the regular water supply and it's doing its thing and the buds will form normally in August. And then the buds form and then uh, they'll just sit there all the way through until next spring. So that period of drought that happened last summer uh, is is really the key, is that when it was going into that period where it wanted to develop some flowers for next year, it just wasn't able to because it just didn't have enough of the water. So number one with plants is first we survive and then we multiply. So so first thing is that the plant's just going to be like, okay, I'm just going to kind of shut down here for a bit. And plants do that. They sometimes go a bit dormant. And then, so let's say you, you come back and you start watering again, and the plant actually recovers a bit from that drought. And it's going along. And it might produce a few uh, flower buds and things, and it might be heading that direction. But because it's so late in the season, those buds don't really get a chance to mature properly. And then over the winter, they're immature buds. They often will just drop or they might freeze. There's a few things that go on with those. So, so you know, you might get a few flowers, but you wouldn't get that full bloom. So I, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's sort of the, the process is that whenever I see a plant that's supposed to bloom in the spring and it doesn't, I look back to when it was setting buds and say, like, what happened then? Like, was that in July? Like a rhododendron, they're, they're already, their buds are often set by now. And so, and they're not going to bloom till next May. So, 
you know, if we have problems. And another thing that's funny is that if you overfeed a plant, like if you have one of these, say, a dogwood, and it wants to bloom, it, it, or it wants to produce its flowers in August, but we feed it a whole bunch of fertilizer in July, and the thing just grows, it goes into growth phase, and it produces a bunch of beautiful foliage and everything, and it's not going to go into reproductive phase because it's in growth phase. So it won't produce any flowers, which means it won't bloom next year. So there's two factors there. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Now, I guess my my concern going forward is, you know, with the, you know, continued drought that we have mm -hmm. um, on the west side, you know, my yard is, you know, traditionally, you know, lawn, and I've got like 30 trees on a, on a 0.2 acre lot. So, right. you know, it, it takes a lot of water, um, paper bark maples, katsuras, dogwoods, uh, larches, all water trees. So I'm really concerned about uh, restricting the water to these trees in the um, hottest part of the year, like mm -hmm. especially my larches and so on, because they're susceptible to going brown and burning very easily. Um, what can I do to, you know, other than changing my yard to a, you know, more of a drought tolerant yard? Is there anything that I can do to help these plants? Yeah, what you want to do is you want to have a, an actual list of, of all the plants that you do have, and you could actually send it to me if you had a list of all the trees, and then I could rate those species based on their drought tolerance. And, and I'll tell you right now, the two types of trees that you have to make sure you get water to are the Japanese maple family and the dog or dogwood family. So dogwoods and Japanese maples are the top of that heap when it comes to water. The larches will get some brown crispy leaves from time to time, but you know, they're they'll survive. They're they're really, really tough plant. And a lot and even the paper bark maples, like I'm so surprised, you know, they do get a little bit of dead wood in them if they go through a severe summer. Um, but you know, I would just say that it's if you'd like, and, and I'd welcome that actually, if you wanted to just, you know, make a list of all the plants that you have that are your favorites. And then what we do is we pick your top, top 10 favorite plants or the top 10 that need water for sure. And then, you know, let's just put those on the list. And that really shrinks down your targeting, your water targeting, you know? Okay. So that might be the way to go. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks for calling, Eric. Bye-bye. Yep. Bye-bye. Yeah, it's really a tricky thing when you have a mixed landscape of different types of plants. And, and sometimes we plant them and not, not realizing that we're going to suffer a drought like this. And, and this drought is, is just absolutely unheard of. <laughs> I mean, we get droughts, but this one is unbelievable. And so, you know, on an average, on an average year or an average drought year, those plants would come through quite well. Uh, another one that needs water is that Cercidophyllum japonicum. That's a katsura tree. Uh, that's a tree that doesn't do well when it dries out. So, you know, again, if you if you have a list of those plants that you need, uh, you know, you need to know what their water requirements are and if they can survive drought. Another one that I think of is a Hinoki cypress. And Hinoki cypress is one of my all-time favorite plants. And now in the Okanagan, we tend to plant them in part shade or shade because they do okay in the sun, but they just, they don't like to dry out. And they sometimes don't recover from drought, meaning that if they dry right out, they'll sometimes just die, even if you water it right away. And it doesn't look, you know, it looks fine and you're watering it, but it got a little too dry and the thing just dies. So, you know, I would say, uh, you know, those types of plants need to be identified and those are plants you want to make sure you get water to. But then when you have other plants that are very, very uh, drought tolerant, you know, th you know, those plants you need to skip and just move on. All right, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's it for this part of the show. Uh, we're going to take another short break here, and we'll be back with more AM 1150 Garage. Alrighty, welcome back everyone. Uh, Ken Salville here today and Don Burnett is away today. Um, I think he's in the garden. Not sure. Anyway, it is a smoky day and um, yeah, not too much we can do about it. And, uh, certainly the plants can't get out of the smoke, but uh, they're affected by in some ways, but uh, probably not much, uh, not, not in a, a, a drastic way. 
but it is what it is, and uh, we have to. We can't really do much about it at this point. Hopefully, it'll all clear out tonight, and then tomorrow we'll have a great day in the garden. It'll be a little bit cooler, and uh, maybe even a little shower tomorrow night. Wouldn't that be nice? All right, so uh, again, we do invite your calls, 250-862-2525 today, and uh, give us a call so we can chat a little bit more about gardening and answer some questions for you. Uh, Some of the things that are happening, I keep reading about uh, these gypsy moths that are ravaging certain areas, uh, particularly down at the, the coastal regions, um, you know, we have to keep our eyes peeled for these, uh, these attacks. And we talked about tent caterpillars and webworms just at the top of the show. And, and, um, you know, they're, they're pretty common and we're seeing uh, quite a few around the area. Uh, and this is just where you see that massive web that shows up in your tree. It's usually an elderberry or a maple tree or cherries, choke cherries, plum trees, that sort of thing. And uh, you'll see the web start small, and then it grows and grows and grows until eventually it can get about six feet across. And, of course, these webworms are living inside this web mass through the daytime. But at night, they venture outwards, and they eat the leaves from the tree, and they keep expanding that web. Now, of course, they, they, they don't have like a... Their life expectancy is only so long. They just go until they're mature. And then uh, as far as I know, most of them will just form a cocoon. And uh, some some species will drop to the ground and form a cocoon, whereas other ones will just uh, stay in the tree. And they will uh, hatch out of that cocoon when the time is right and fly and lay eggs again. So uh, interestingly enough, they are uh, they're relatively not that harmful to the tree unless you get a massive infestation. And so we're just talking about gypsy moths and gypsy moths are one of these plant, these insects that can really take over and uh, they can sometimes just completely defoliate a tree. Now, when you get complete defoliation, of course, the tree is just struggling to survive. Uh, They need all those leaves in order to be able to produce the food to stay alive. And so no leaves, no food, and it's kind of a, a tough thing. So, um, you know, I, I haven't heard of any of them here in the Okanagan yet, and uh, we have to keep our ears peeled. If anybody out there knows uh, anything about the status of the gypsy moth, it would really be nice to hear about it just to see if, if they are indeed coming out this way. We always, uh, you know, keep our eyes peeled for these things. And again, this garden show is one way that people, if they see something that's unusual, uh, they can either, you know, call in and ask about it. We often suggest that you'll, if you see something, you take a picture of it and email it uh, typically to myself or to Don. And, and uh, yeah, we can have a look at that and then identify it. We'll often forward it on to maybe even uh, one of the local entomologists here where they can have a look at it just to positively identify the the creature. And remember that insect populations multiply more quickly when temperatures are higher. So here we are in a heat wave, and it's been hot all season long. So unfortunately, that means that the insect populations will tend to multiply much quicker, much more quickly than, than they normally would. So, you know, where you, if you would normally have 100,000 aphids, well, now you're going to have maybe 100 million aphids. And so that, that whole issue, higher temperatures mean quicker, more rapid uh, multiplying. Now, uh, with that in mind... Um, It just seems to be really spotty this year. Like I'm not seeing really a lot of insects anywhere. Uh, I'm seeing some insects everywhere, but it's like whole categories of insects are just missing in in action, and I'm really not seeing all that much out there. A few outbreaks of aphids, a few outbreaks. It seems like there's quite a few spider mites around, but again, you know, they don't really kill a plant. They just just make it look a bit dull in color. you know, but the uh, these uh, these uh, uh, moths, like the tent caterpillars and webworms, are are becoming. They're kind of right now in about their peak, and it's not the worst year for them. I found with these um, these insects that you have a year or two where they're really bad, and then a year or two where they're eh, not so bad. And I think we're sort of in that cycle that even though our temperatures are warm and they're multiplying quickly, uh, they're still, I don't think they're in that high uh, cycle right now. I think they're actually in a lower cycle. But um, yeah, it's interesting. You have to keep your eyes peeled, looking for things that are unusual. 
And um, remember the two different ways it just in the Okanagan here, we tend to have more of the webworms. Webworms are yellow. They're kind of fuzzy and yellow looking. Uh, we do have a few tent caterpillars. They have a, they have kind of a brownish yellow hair, but they're, they don't have as much hair. They're more longer and skinnier and they'll ha- often have blue spots on them. They're a little more colorful looking and just the caterpillar itself. So if you do see those, uh, have a close look and, um, Feel free to destroy them. But, you know, like I say, some people used to burn them and cut them out of the trees. I just say if you can reach it, just grab it and pull all the webbing out, and that's all you have to do. Uh, they actually get trapped in their own webbing when you do that, and it really uh, really slows things down. And if you leave a few behind, a few is not going to cause any problem at all. So not to worry about that. All right, well, we're going to go back to the phone lines. We have Maureen on line one. Good morning, Maureen. Oh, good morning, Ken. I was actually listening to you as I was walking my dog, so ah. it was perfect. <laughs> and the whole time I wanted to uh, make a quick call. Sure. Um, I um, have um, a, a two above-ground uh, garden beds in the backyard, mm-hmm. and I have my tomato plants in, in some big pots. I only have about four tomato plants this year. I had about 18, and I had too many tomatoes last year. <laughs> right. Anyway, so I went out there, and um, I noticed already, first of all, I've my cu- cucumbers have been climbing up a tomato support, and mm-hmm. I've got lots and lots of cucumbers, but I'm noticing the leaves turning, getting that powdery mildew again, oh. like quite a few. Some are turning yellow, and some are already with the powdery mildew. So what I did was I cut all, all those leaves off yesterday and did spray with the baking soda, but I bet mm-hmm. it's too late. Uh, well, remember to focus on the new leaves. Fo- oh. Focus on the yes, leaves. Yes, I did. I I, foc- I sp- cut off the old powdery mildew leaves and all the yellow ones and then just sprayed all the good leaves. Yeah, and right on the growing tips, right? Because that's where they'll produce new leaves and those new leaves are born without mildew. Oops, maybe. Oh, you just suddenly cut off. By growing tip, do you mean um, like where the leaf comes out? Yeah, the very tip of the shoot. Oh my goodness, you're cutting out there suddenly. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's your phone. Maybe give it a shake. There, how's that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I can hear you just fine on this end. Um, yeah, should so I, should I call again, Ken? Try again. Uh, I, th- I think it might be your phone because I think we're we're hearing you loud and clear on this end. I think we're all good. Okay, but, let's see uh, if I can. There. Yeah, hang in there. Hold, stand in one oh, spot. Out again. I'll give you another call. Okay, Ken. Yes, please do. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah, the mildew thing is really, really uh, one of these things that is uh, really, really a big deal in the Okanagan. And uh, this year it hasn't been so bad yet, but we just had a little bit of cooling trend at night and that's all it takes to get the mildew going. And then once it goes, you have to uh, get on that. Now, are we going to wait for Maureen or do you want to... Oh, we're going to take a quick uh, break or we have Ross on the line there. What time is it? Oh, yes. We'll take a quick break and then we'll come back with more AM 1150 Bridge. All righty, we are back, and we do have Maureen back on the line. Thanks for holding, everyone. I really appreciate that. And Maureen, go ahead. Oh, hi, Ken. Yeah. yeah so I was just wondering about the powdery mildew on the yeah. cucumber plants, and I wondered, is that a cause of the intense heat? Well, it's it only is, it actually, it proliferates right around 20 degrees Celsius, so that's the sweet spot, and that's sort of your evenings through to morning. So when you get these right. long periods and warm nights, that's what really stimulates it. But what you need to do is get that baking soda on to, and you remember, you can't control it once it starts. You can I know. only prevent I was, it. So you <laughs> I use remembering that. Yeah, use the baking soda, and remember to use zinc as well. Uh, right. Zinc is the like vitamin Z that you buy at the uh, at the pharmacy. You just crush right. up one tablet in about a half a liter of water, and you spritz that all over the plant too. And that really helps because they know that plants that are zinc deficient get mildew. Well, perfect. I've got that ready to go. Um, but do I, and I'll do it to all my other plants that are kind of prone as well. Yes. But do I, um, do I do, I did the baking soda yesterday and I also put it on my tomato plants. Yes. Just to, and actually, I put it on everything in the garden. Good. But do I do zinc today, baking soda the next day, go back and forth like that yes, every other exactly. day? Yes, exactly. That's okay. it. Do that. That's the way to go. 
and okay. it works fabulous. You bet. And maybe don't pick the hottest part of the day to do that either. That's right. You want it to soak <laughs> in slowly, so you do it early in the okay. morning or the evening. Okay, that's perfect. And my other quick, quick question was, I just think that my tomato plants aren't really producing as much as I had, I had expected. And mm-hmm. also some of the ye- leaves are turning yellow. What does that mean when the leaves are turning yellow? Well, you have to have a close look at it um, uh, because there's several things that cause that. But what I would do is I would be pinching off any of those leaves at the bottom that turn yellow. Okay. And when it is at the bottom, it can be food, it can be drying out, or it can be flea beetle. So flea beetles okay. are this little uh, bug that comes along. It doesn't really bother them. It just causes some okay. yellow leaves. So, Should I be fertilizing those tomato plants, I gave them um, tomato food food yep. um, a long time, like but at least a month ago. Should oh, yeah. I do that again? And, yes. and do I add 20, 20, 20 to everything? Or, well, or, it certainly uh, works. I would say fertilizing once a week is the is the minimum. Oh, okay. That's the minimum. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. All right. Maybe that'll help. Thank you, Ken. All right. Okay. Thanks, Maureen. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Thanks for holding on. Ross, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still there. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Ross. Go um, ahead. Yeah. At first, I want to just thank you for uh, being so knowledgeable and uh, being so very, very pleasant. Aww. So thank you. Well, that's thank. thank and you. Uh, my question is about uh, fruit trees uh, watering, and um, especially after the fruit is gone, and also blackberries and raspberries, the same thing after the fruit's gone in this kind of weather. Yeah, what sort of, uh, and and so what is the status right now? Like, you have you been feeding those plants all the year long? No, I haven't fed them at all. I just give them lots of water. Okay, and and would you say that the plants are looking relatively healthy? Or yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so this is one of the things that when you see sort of symptoms of uh, of starvation, you know, then then you feel like you want to be feeding more. But you know, every time you water a plant, you're actually washing those nutrients into the root zone of the plant. So it's like it's funny. You're not actually applying any fertilizers, but you're taking the nutrients that are there. And then you're wetting them down and then washing them into the roots, and it's like feeding the plant. So what what it sounds like to me is that your plants are actually doing quite well, and they've got a really nice uh, – your soils and everything have have a certain amount of nutrient that seems to be enough for those plants. But, um, you know, compost at any time is always beneficial. So whether you take like a real fine uh, composted product, um, we often you dry it out and crush it up fine and then just apply it underneath your trees or along your berry patches. And that can just add this extra, a uh, little bit of extra sort of balanced nutrient uh, uh, bump. You know, when it gets hot in the summer, the plants often get quite hungry. Okay, the, uh, but like with the raspberries and blackberries, um, what I'm talking about or what I'm asking about is uh, once the fruit is all gone, do they, how often do they have to be watered? Uh, they still need to be maintained at a regular watering cycle. Um, if you know, if you're happy with the way they're growing and they've got that really nice, you know, healthy look, if you start to back off to the point where they start to fail or get crispy leaves. They lose their they they can start to lose some of their their vigor. So I would just say what you do is you you don't water as much as you do when it's in fruit production, but there's still a minimum requirement for those. Like um I, like I had I had raspberries that were just oh they were horrible, and then when I started watering them more regularly, they became beautiful and they were just incredible and produced really well. And then I, you know, after they fruited, I, you know, I just kind of let them dry out a bit. And I had quite a bit that they just didn't perform. Like I wanted to grow the wood for the next year, but I need to keep up with the watering at least reasonably. Like reasonably. And with the, uh, with the fruit trees, is uh, more water, the more the water, the better? Uh, no, not really. About once a week on the, on the fruit trees and maybe about twice a week on the berries should be enough to get you through, as long as when you're watering them, you're giving them, you know, a deep watering. Yeah. Uh, the key with it, with any of these plants, and especially the fruit trees, is that if they get stressed by drought, they will attract some pretty nasty insects. So um, there's, a, there's a gas that they release called ethylene gas. And when a plant gets stressed out, it gives off this ethylene gas. And little beetles, like the ambrosia beetle, which is a borer that burrows right into the wood, they're attracted by that smell, that smell of that ethylene gas. So, you know, I'm, I'm really cautious about just not letting them get too stressed. Yeah, oh. So. Okay, thanks ever so much, Denny. Eh? Okay, Ross, thank you hey, very much. Yeah. Hey, hey, bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. 
All right, and I think we have Karen on line one. Karen, are you there? Thanks for holding. Yeah, no problem. I'm here. Um, I was just thinking as I was looking at some old recipes and saw one for cherry, because I used to have a thing cherry tree, but uh, as it was getting aged and, and a lot of the main branches kind of went dead and stuff, so I let it go, but it was a... It was a Bing cherry tree and just wondered how easy is it to find Bing cherries around uh, uh, the Okanagan. Yeah. Well, that's a really good question. You know, it's an older variety and uh, some of the the newer growers have gone away from that variety because the uh, newer varieties are more resistant to the splitting and, and uh, the, you know, their timing is better. But there are still some around. Uh, as far as I remember, they had quite a short stem on the Bing, like it was a big cherry with a shorter stem. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not a very long stem, but big, plump, juicy, dark, mm-hmm. dark cherry. Yeah. Yeah, a sweet variety that was more dessert style, but not so much for the baking because of it being mm-hmm. extreme sweet. Yeah, well, they were really good, and they're a bit earlier, too. So, uh, yeah, I yeah. always found the uh, weather pending where if it was a uh, easy breezy winter, then before the end of June, my tree was coming off. But mm-hmm. if it was a longer weather or longer winter, it was going into the first couple of weeks of July mm-hmm. and pick quite crazy. Yeah, exactly. And, and so nowadays the newer varieties are way later. They all come like starting probably about mid-July through to right to September. I'm pretty sure they're still picking at the end of August. And those ones are really, really, they've got a lot of advantages to that. They sort of miss the whole splitting thing. So for the growers, yeah. it's better. And there's some really good varieties. Yeah. Yeah, I just kind of, I actually... On the good years, I'd have such an abundance, and as my husband and I choose to go our separate ways, I decided why waste the tree. Mm. My dad would help me pick it, and my mom and I would sort everything and pick mm. it, and all I asked was two bucks a pound, and I'd deliver, and yeah. I had a standing order of some people, friends and neighbors that I'd call them up and say, hey, and at two mm-hmm. bucks a pound. That's it. That is it. Really good price, and you know the um, man. Those it's trees, the, the trees produce a lot. <laughs> oh heck! Uh, on a lousy year, it could be maybe a hundred pounds, but if it was a really, really good year, three hundred pounds at least. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? I and and know. that's uh, sorting the tree. That was the sorted stuff going out. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and then a lot of that went into your own freezer and into the canning. I bet too. Uh, I got to a point where I could only handle very small doses of cherries after that. Yeah, yeah. I had for myself, but mm-hmm. I had one friend kind of complain about the price when I sold her some cherries, and it's like, well, okay, getting a good deal. If you went to the local store, uh, you'd mm-hmm. be paying half, again, that amount, and yep. at least you're getting them sorted. Yep, you bet. Which, which they don't do at the store, you might wind up with crap on the knees. Yeah, that's right. Well, they certainly, uh, they're, they're, oh, they're, there's, it's really nice, anyway, in the Okanagan to have so many cherries and so many varieties available. It's just fabulous. So we're lucky to yeah. live here, and you can get varieties. You can get even just a small bag. So what what direction of the Okanagan might I find being cherries? Because I really, Oof. for when I could handle eating them, after seeing so many, uh, yeah. where's a good area to well, find things if I really wanted? That's a good question. I think they're finished now because they yeah. were they were quite early. But um, yeah, that's a good question. I think you'd have to phone around to some of the fruit stands and fruit growers, and you could ask that question. Or again, if there's anybody listening to the show today that have any clues as to an orchard or somebody who's selling them. Uh, then that would be the way to go. I'm not sure you can still buy them at the garden centers, like as far as the trees go. Uh, I'm not sure if I saw one this spring or not. But anyway, yeah, Bing was a good I old could, variety. Yeah, unless I could come across an orchardist uh, mm. with at least one Bing cherry that could, and I somehow picked this up from Don years ago, but mm-hmm. I think there's a way of taking a 
taking a piece from from a tree and, and getting it going, or where you can actually add it to other trees, but yeah, even to maybe look at it's grafting, uh, getting yeah. a starter going to get a tree going. Yeah. Usually what you do is you buy a, t- a tree that you like that's a good variety, maybe one of these new later varieties, and then you can, if you can find a Bing cherry tree, you can take some grafts. So you do bud grafting through the month of August, which is right now, and uh, you'd find those trees. You have to make sure they're positively identified because it's hard to identify them when, they're, when they don't have fruit, especially. But you take some of the buds off those plants and you can insert them into the branches of, the, uh, of your main tree. And then you'd have two types of cherries. You'd have an early one, the bings, and then you'd have a late one, which is one of the yeah. ones. Yeah. Although I really didn't mind uh, seeing as, that's all I had in my backyard was a lonely uh, Bing cherry tree, and I'm around Quigley Mitchell Hollywood Road area, right. so I'm quite certain it's a fairly high percentage chance that it again was an area of orchard land. Mm-hmm. But I didn't seem to mind the early onset of taking care of the cherry because mm-hmm. it's when the heat is starting, not the middle of the summer when you're melting all over the pavement (laughs) yeah exactly well that's why you know we don't really recommend that people grow cherry trees in their backyard unless they're avid uh, uh, you know gardeners and will take care of them because it is a it is something that we all have to spray our cherry trees so that we don't create uh, insect pest problems for the orchardists who try so hard to keep the the worms out and all that so so that's something that's a real important thing is if you can't take care of them you got to cut them down yeah, and I actually was keeping the tree sprayed, and when I, because I had such a bulk load, what once I got past my handful of standing orders uh, every year, then the rest, as I said, my mom would help me sort after my dad would come early and mm-hmm. and pick a, a bunch each morning early and whatnot. And my mom's gone. My dad's ninety. It's uh, yeah. It's good thing the tree's gone, but anyway, I always let people know when I went down to like Turtle Bay or Hiawatha campgrounds. Nice. I did have one senior citizen couple. The lady says, "I'm sorry, I I am only into organics." I said, "Okay, have a great day." I floated off and carried on, and on my way out, I had one lonely one pound container, and had left them each a sample, and had said. I spray it for the worms because I don't provide the tequila. <laughs> and when I uh, was on my there way out, the husband came trotting over to me. Have you got any of My wife changed her mind. <laughs> there you go. Well, you know what? We have to uh, move on, Karen. Thank you so much for calling in today. Yeah, well, thanks for your help. And, yeah, um, I'd almost be willing to look at a another tree or at least know where somebody's got some bean cherries because I really yeah. found they were nice. Well, you never know. Thank you, and and have yourself a great day, and I hope Don's having fun with his wife, whatever they're doing. You bet. That's awesome. Thanks, Karen. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. 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 All right. uh, On that note, uh, we do invite your calls, 862-2525. That's 250-862-2525. And we'll be back after these messages with more AM 1150 Birch. We are back with you today, and it is, uh, I think the sun is kind of pushing through the smoke out there. I don't know, maybe I'm seeing things. Anyway, it is a beautiful day. Anyway, we're lucky to be in the Okanagan. It is a lovely spot. It's going to be hot out there. It's going to be smoky out there. So, I don't know, maybe you should be in listening to the garden show. There you go. All right, so thanks again for everybody for tuning in today and for asking questions. It's always nice, uh, 250-862-2525 if you do have a gardening question. And uh, we did have uh, another question that came in on the email, which was uh, uh, Don has asked, his peach tree has many little blobs of sap on the branches. And he's wondering, what is that about? Well, that's a really good question. Um, With the peach trees... They do suffer often uh, with a couple of things. The, the term for that is called gumminosis, is when they produce this gummy sap that appears on the plant. Um, if you have little bits here and there all over the, the, 
the peach tree and it, it it's included on uh, let's say little dead branches little twigs and they're kind of gummy and drippy and then you'll see these little uh, lesions on them like a split or a crack in the in the bark that appears to be healing or trying to heal but again little droplets of of sap you know that's uh, that's typically again if it's associated with the twigs and branches that's crinium blight and crinium blight is very common on peaches and apricots more common even on apricots but uh, this is a disease that does cause a twig dieback each year and and it can be it can be devastating on some years but uh, with that typical of peach trees and soft fruit trees apricots nectarines and even cherries uh, they're often sprayed in the fall with a uh, with a copper spray so copper is applied uh, usually around uh, early October, somewhere there, maybe mid-October, and the trees are coated with the copper, and it prevents these diseases from proliferating over the winter. So the fall application on the soft fruit trees is one of the things that saves that tree from being enveloped from all these fungus diseases over winter, in particular, corinium blight. So this particular disease is common, and that's most likely what, what Don has there on his peach tree, uh, I always look a little closer because if I do see a, a blob of sap, I always check and see, is there actually like a little tunnel underneath that? Is there a little hole, like a little 16th inch of hole, or is there actually even a little bigger hole underneath it? So is the sap coming out of a hole? If it is, then that's usually a creature, like a little borer insect of some sort. So you, you want to check that out if that is the case, but then you clip out and remove those pieces. Um, if that gumminosa stuff starts to occur on the main trunk, then again, you have to check and see if there's any holes underneath. If you're not finding any holes underneath these blobs of sap, then you know it's just a fungus of some sort and the tree is oozing the sap out of its, uh, right out of its bark. So in that case, you know, again, typically fall applications of copper uh, for as a fungicide and then also repeating some other uh fungicide in the spring like the lime sulfur product which is sometimes used on on soft fruits just you don't apply that to apricots so make that note right away if you own an apricot tree do not apply sulfur products to the apricot tree particularly lime sulfur it's excellent on peaches though and so be aware of that um, uh, if you ever do get the blobs of sap down low on the tree in the bottom one foot or even right at the ground level and you see sap bubbling out of the ground, you should always inspect your soft fruits for that. And that is more of a peach tree borer. And peach tree borers get into all kinds of uh, prunus species. So they'll get into anything that has a single stone fruit in it and they'll burrow right at the ground level and they want to get even down into the roots. And often there's sugars in those roots where they, they love to eat that, that tissue. And so they become a grub about an inch long or so, and sometimes even an inch and a half if it's the large, larger version. And uh, if you do see these things around the base of your peach tree, you can get the old uh, electrical wire out, maybe like a 14-gauge a wire, and you just bend the tip over make a little fish hook out of it. And you can just push that in and out of the holes until you pull out a nice big fat white uh, white grub out of there. And if you can just pull them out by hand, that's the way to do them. You can get them out and uh, so you find the sap. What I often will do is I'll clean around the base of the plant, cut back all the grass and stuff, and make sure I can see the, the, where it goes into the ground nice and clear. And I'll clean off all the debris and stuff that, that might be oozing out of the plant, that might be old. And sometimes I'll even hose it off so it's nice and clean. And then I just wait a few hours or maybe the next day and I come back and I'll see one of those holes is really bubbling out and you can see the frass coming out, which is a, um, you know, like this, uh, sort of like the droppings and the chewings of the grub. And so you'll see that coming out uh, of the, uh, mixed in with the sap. And when you see that, you know, aha, that's where the borer is. So if we know that's the spot, it looks like the fresh spot, that's where we go digging with our little wire. And lo and behold, we can often pull those guys out. On a small tree, they can be quite devastating and sometimes almost kill the tree. But larger trees seem to be able to survive with it. But still not a good thing, that's for sure. So, All right, so that's peach tree borer. And uh, they can be visible at all different times of the year. All right, uh, we're going to go back to the phone lines. And we have Addie on the line. Good morning, Addie. Good 
Good morning, Ken. How are you? I'm doing pretty good, thanks. How are you? Not bad in this smoky, hot weather, but however, we're coping. Yeah. Uh, last week, I asked you guys about, uh, like Don was saying, to put uh, like a 10-52-10 or something on uh, my um, um, trees that I want more bloom from. I could mm-hmm. do it now so they'll bloom more next year. Mm-hmm. Now, I can't find either one, 10-52 or 10-60-10 anywhere. Yeah, it comes as a water soluble fertilizer, and it's it can often be called seed starter fertilizer because seeds and young plants uh, need that extra phosphorus, that middle number, to stimulate the roots to grow. And so um, that's something you might you might see it camouflaged, and it's called seed starter or or. Uh, Something like that. <laughs> it's, okay, so it's hard to so it's, uh, so if I asked for seed starter, it would be ten fifty two ten. Yeah, what you're looking for is just a high middle number. So you know yeah. how you have fifteen thirty fifteen is a common water soluble fertilizer. That's what I use. And, yeah. And so that's a ratio of one to one, and so that's that's pretty good. But what what at ten fifty two ten you've got like a one five one ratio. So it's really high in phosphorus. So that's what really often will kick plants into gear if they are uh, needing a boost of phosphorus. So that's so I why... Would be, I would be starting to put that on now. Now how often would I be doing it? Or just once before before the fall sets in? I would do it about once every two weeks, but I would stop fertilizing by the middle of August here. So you you just want to get a couple feeds in and that should be about it. Oh, yeah. is that right? Yeah, and okay, then and with this yeah. ratio thing, right, the five, one, th- one, five, one ratio, uh, and we were just saying how the regular one, like 15, 30, 15, is a one, two, one ratio. Anything that you can find, it doesn't have to be 10, 52, 10. It could be 10, 40, 10, or it could be 10, uh, it, could be, it could be anything. As long as that middle number is really nice and high in comparison with the other numbers, that will give you the effect you want. Okay, so any of the so then I would do it till the middle of August, and then uh, start again next spring when it gets the same May. Yeah, do, you'd start right away first thing in the spring. Yeah, even when it's not hot. Oh yeah, yeah. They they mm-hmm. they do like that product. It's really nice. So works okay. well. And a, a trumpet vine. Mm-hmm. Are they also bushes or or are they just vines? Uh, well, they're vine when they're climbing on something, but if they're not climbing, then they just become a bush sort of creeping. They're often called trumpet creepers, so they'll just grow on the ground and just form like a big mound. So, so you could grow, you could grow them as a shrub then. Well, like a, like I say, a creeper. They kind of yeah. creep around, and uh, yeah. They're very, very pretty plant, and they're sure blooming a lot this year. They seem to. Yeah, be. well, they are. Mine didn't bloom that much. Mine's only three years old right now, so I think yeah. that it's still in its, uh, you know, growing process. But however, oh, yeah. I'll give it some of that ten fifty two ten or whatever I can find with the high middle number a couple of times this year, and then first thing next spring and see how it uh, how it provides. And that's the same for all the uh, perennial plants, flowering plants like the rose of Sharon and everything like that. Yeah, pretty much all of them would appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. The, uh, the other you. thing, I'll just mention one more thing about the trumpet vine is that in the springtime when they start to shoot out and they get these nice new shoots coming, they'll send some from the bottom or wherever they come. Remember that the growing tips are where they bloom from. So yeah. always on a tip. So if I grew, if I let's say I, I zoom ahead, I'm, it's in the spring, but I zoom up to about the beginning of May. And at the beginning of May, I'm getting all these long tentacles growing up. And then if I just went along and just pinched off just the very tip of each of those long tentacles, they would all split into two. So then I would have twice as many growing tips. And How does that again? You split, you split each pinch. one like once you see the little tentacles. They usually have little buds at the, at the, on them. Yeah, but they're not flower buds yet because you're right at the beginning of May. So they're just shoot, shooting up. They might only be a foot tall or so. But any time you snip the tip, it will branch and form more more branches. And the more branches you get, the more flowers you get. So it's a way of speeding it up a bit. Interesting. So should I be trimming mine back now? Because it's, it's come all the way up my wall and I'm going onto my roof. 
No, I would just leave it for now. But, you know, any time a vine gets into your roof or into your soffits, you know, you, you could go ahead and cut it off because they can cause some damage, right, to eaves troughs and that sort of thing. So I, I would just say you could cut it off if you like. It's it's not a normal time to prune them only because they're blooming right now, right? So Okay, so after they stop blooming, though, let's say in uh, end of uh, September, October? Oh, yeah. Yeah, any time anytime you want, you could cut that, but... Next year, you want to cut it extra low so that it can grow back up into that space. Yeah, because I want to take it off my roof. I'm okay with the with growing on the wall, but it's yeah. come up the roof, and I don't want it to go up the roof. You can cut to... that right now, then. Just get rid of it. Yep. Okay. You don't have Super. to wait. Great. Thank you very much, Ken. Okay, Addy. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. All righty, there you go. It's just an awesome thing. Okay, we're going to take our last break of the show, so uh, we'll take a quick break, and we'll be back with more in 1150 Gardens. All righty, we are back uh, again. Uh, Don Burnett's away today, but I'm at the helm here answering gardening questions. And so we do invite your calls. Might have time for just one or two more calls. Um, but we do have Linda on the line. Good morning, Linda. Hi. Good morning. I've got um, my my orange tree, which comes in the house during the winter and is out during the summer, is still in the house. If I put it outside now on the deck in the sun, is that smoke going to protect it from getting burnt to a crisp from being indoors to going out? Mm, no. <laughs> it's not? It's not going to be enough. Um, there's quite a difference, you know, when you go from inside to outside. And uh, what happens is the leaves grow this very thin sort of a epidermis, the upper surface of the leaf, because it's been growing indoors and it's sort of set up to, to maximize the amount of light to penetrate into the leaf. And so that's how it's set up. So when we move it outside, even on a cloudy day or even pouring rain or something, the plant would still be way too bright or way brighter than what it would be used to uh, when it first goes out. It can develop an immunity to the sun if it's done very gradually. So if you did have to get it outside, you put it in a shady spot and keep it out of the sun, and then uh, just slowly, like it would have to live for a week in the shade and then another oh. week with a little bit of sun. You know, so you have to wean it not off. Not so easy it. when it's seven feet tall. No, it's not easy at all. So... You know, I would say maybe uh, maybe just, you know, leave it where it is unless there's some reason that you have to move it for sure. Now, I had called um, a few months ago about it. It's, mm-hmm. it's an old one. It's 40-some years old, and, right. and it's got um, scale on it. Oh. I've been wiping the leaves off, but a lot of the leaves, when I go to wipe them, just fall off. Oh, yeah. And, and, it's, and it's lost, I'm sure, more than half of its leaves. Mm-hmm. Um, does does the scale also go on the bark of the of the tree? Yes, it does, and and that's the trick. Is that when it's on the bark, you can, you really have such a hard time seeing it, and so um, it would be ideal to get that thing outside into a shady spot if it was at all possible, and then you could spend a little bit more time again, sort of uh, rubbing. I just sort of touch the bark with my with my thumb and forefinger and just kind of run it over the bark. And anywhere there's a scale, especially if they're alive and healthy, they'll they'll just squish so easily. And uh, so, and then when you do get them outside, especially after you squish a few of them, it sort of emits a smell like there's food there. And then the wasps will come in and they'll eat all the scale off the tree once they identify them. Will and, they? Yeah, and that's why scale don't have like certain scale, especially these soft scales that get on our tropical plants. Uh, they they're uh, they're often consumed uh, just like an aphid would be consumed if it was outside, but indoors, you know, there's nothing there to eat it, so they kind of no. proliferate around. So. I did read that I did read that wasps will eat scale, but I mm-hmm. and we certainly have an abundance of wasps. Yes, and, yeah. but I didn't know how quickly or if they would. Now, the mm-hmm. as far as rubbing the getting the scales off the bark the bark is not smooth so mm-hmm. it's quite rough and it's difficult to find yeah. they'll be close to the they'll be close to where the bark transitions from a rough crunchy bark and it starts to smooth out as you get closer to the branch tips yeah. that's where the scale are going to be hanging out is on that they're not so much on the older 
rough bark, but on those uh, softer bits, so where it's still transitioning. Okay. Yeah, so check that out. Is uh, there anything to put in that, uh, or put on it that I, or just just yes. a rag and water to rub it with? Yeah, well, they use the horticultural oil on scale insect for tropical plants, and uh, that's a, a product which you can purchase, and it's quite a nice, clean, refined oil. And you just there's mixing instructions, and you can you can take the thing outside in a shady spot, spray the whole thing top to bottom, let it sit for a couple days. Again, keep it right out of the sun. Hit it again. Do another spray about three days later, at top to bottom, and then just leave it outside for about maybe a week, and then give it a leaching while it's out there, so you can get the soil all cleaned out and ready to come back in for another winter. And then just bring it back in, and then you'd still keep an eye open for those scale, but that should get it, uh, you know, much more under control. Okay. Well, I'll give it a try. I the, the challenge of getting it outside, besides on the deck, is going to be something because <laughs> yeah, it, you know, in the pot, it's got to be fifty pounds. And yeah, what I do is I I buy those little uh, dollies, you know, the round dollies with the wheels on them. Yes, and I you have can, those. Yeah, and you buy a really good one because they they're quite heavy and they're they're. In one that's oversized, like a little bit wider, and then just to hold the balance, and then you get two people, one on each side, and away you go out the door. And oh, it's a challenge, but it's well, and getting it out, it's twice the size of the door, too. <laughs> oh, so usually I walk it through one branch at a time out the sliding glass doors, but yeah. Well, we'll see how it goes. Good we'll luck. We'll give it a try. Yeah, maybe it'll work. All yeah, right. Thank well, you very much for your help. You're welcome. Okay. Thanks for calling, Linda. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. All right, so we're going to have to wrap up the show here. Thanks so much for everybody for calling in and all the great questions. That was really nice. And, uh, yeah, so we're just going to do the tip of the week. All right, now my tip of the week. This week was it's time to plant onions. What? That's right. We have to plant some onions right now in early August so we can get those onions up and growing so that by the time we hit uh, the winter, they're ready to overwinter. They'll go right through the winter in the ground. Next spring, they'll be up super early and growing, and that'll give us a nice full-size onion for next year. Uh, Remember to use netting over your your onions because it'll help to keep those uh, nasty flies off of them that cause the... uh, problems with the onions so always net your onions with an insect screen all right now my plant of the week was a hydrangea annabelle which a hydrangea annabelle is a great uh, plant very beautiful in bloom now and super easy to grow and uh, tough grows anywhere sun or shade all right that's my tips and plants for this week remember to check growercoach.com and uh, we were talking a little bit about uh, powdery mildew earlier in the show and i did just put out a video i think it was about a week ago in regards to uh, powdery mildew, and the title of the video is, is that vitamins cure powdery mildew? And that's a, that's a good good title. Not so sure it cures it, but it certainly cures the problem by preventing it. And we talk about two or three or, or even four different vitamins that you can, uh, you can read about that you can use on your plants and really helps them stay alive and healthy in the garden. That's it for today. Thanks again for tuning in. Remember to check growercoach.com. We'll see you next week with more AM 1150 Wage.